friends and fiends, and welcome to Buried Bones. I'm your host, Cerberus, and this is the show where I go out and dig up some cinematic treats and bring them back here and serve them up hot and fresh for you to enjoy. In this episode, I have the film noir classic The Stranger from 1946. The Stranger also was directed by and stars the legendary Orson Welles. Also starring are Edward G. Robinson, Loretta Young, and Richard Long in the leads with some really outstanding character actors uh, rounding out the rest of the cast. For this episode, I've prepared for you a full meal of cinematic treats. Up front, for a soup and salad kind of starter, I've got some uh, newsreels and film trailers and commercials and whatnot to kind of whet our cinematic appetites. Uh, but uh, please, get comfy and settled in. And you do have still a few moments to go to the snack bar if you need to, but hurry back or you might miss the cartoon. When I come back, I will dig up some of the backstory on this Orson Welles classic right here on Buried Bones. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I'm looking for a good mystery on something off the beaten track like the Maldives Falcon. Oh, that was a fascinating story. But here's one that has everything the Falcon had and more. It's Raymond Chandler's latest bestseller, The Big Sleep. And what a picture that'll make. You mind if I look at it? Huh. Sometimes I wonder what strange fate brought me out of the storm to that house that stood alone in the shadows. As I probed into its mysteries, every clue told me a different story. But each had the same ending, murder. Every instinct warned me to beware that something more dangerous, more deadly than I'd ever known before was in that room. And suddenly... I like that. I'd like more. That's even better. 
presidential yacht Williamsburg stands by in the Potomac to take aboard the chief executive for his first extended vacation since taking over the job 16 months ago. The presidential holiday consists of an offshore cruise north along the New England coast. Rest and diet are the main objectives of Mr. Truman's trip. Aboard the destroyer escort Weiss, 21 White House correspondents keep careful tabs on the Williamsburg, from which they receive telephoned bulletins which are quickly turned into nationwide copy. Coming ashore at Quonset, Rhode Island Naval Air Station, the President gives reporters a first-hand account of his vacation to date and proudly displays the new white yachting cap made especially for this trip. Pretty nifty, Mr. President. Alexander Graham Bell, inventor of the telephone, is again remembered as the 70th anniversary of the first long-distance call is observed at Paris, Ontario, where this primitive instrument was used. A far cry to the modern system with its thousands of operators and a myriad of trunk lines. A large crowd is present at the anniversary to hear Mayor McCammon of Paris open the ceremonies. George Dunlop and Reverend Haig took part in that first experiment which covered eight miles from Brantford to Paris. As a climax to the ceremony, a plaque is unveiled commemorating the inventor and the history-making event, a milestone in communication. Dover's famous castle sees another chapter in its proud history as Winston Churchill, the new warden of the ports, is installed. The mayors and barons don their traditional robes for the occasion. This frontline fortress city turns out wholeheartedly to welcome the great war leader, the Lord Warden himself, resplendent in his most magnificent uniform. His wife, son, and daughter Mary attend the ceremonies, which demands a proud display. No one has a better right to guard this symbolic spot. side of the bed. For that you can almost drop dead. Break a wishbone and if you get the big end, your wish will come true and your troubles will end. Gosh, I wish I had a bird for breakfast. Aha, uh -huh, I get my wish. If you whistle before breakfast, you'll <laughs> cry before dinner. Listen to the mockingbird. Listen to the mockingbird. Still singing where the weeping willows wave. I'm dreaming now of Hallie, sweet Hallie, sweet Hallie. She's 
sleeping in the alley. Find the mocking where she where she lies. Listen to the mocking. Oh, uh -uh. How'd I get in here? Man, you gotta straighten up and fly right. Take it off, and all the day you'll have good luck. E -e. Ain't he superstitious? That's all I wants to know. Hey, boss. Hey, boss. Hey, boss. Hey, boss. Boss, I hate to interrupt you when you's eating, but you done spilled the salt. Yikes! If you spill salt, throw it over your shoulder or you won't live to be much older. Ah, uh, come out. Come out wherever you are. Here I is, boss. Yikes! A ladder. Hey. If you go under a ladder, your days will grow sadder and sadder. Thanks for the information, boss. Oh, that's all right, pal. Hmm. Put it here. Why not? Uh-uh. In the house with an open umbrella will make you a most unfortunate fella. Massage Chateau in California. Almost every night here, there's a wine tasting party, and one of the favorites is Paul Masson Chablis. It's light and crisp. It's delicious. The wine you drink the most should be the best. And they take special care with it here because they know Chablis is America's most popular wine. Paul Masson Chablis. I recommend it. Paul Masson will sell no wine before its time. So without giving away any spoilers, here's what the film's about. Uh, Edward G. Robinson plays a War Crimes Commission investigator who oversees the release of one Nazi war criminal in order to follow him and hopefully catch another even bigger, badder Nazi war criminal, played by Orson Welles. So the manhunt leads them to New England, 
where they all end up in the same small little town and a fantastic game of cat and mouse comes after that. Um, this happens to have been Orson Welles' fourth feature film, but actually this is the first one of his to make any money. And there's a little story behind as to why. So it turns out that this is the last film being distributed by International Pictures from RKO Studios. Also happens to be the last film that RKO Studios is doing with Orson Welles. He's not been commercially successful for them yet. Uh, he did Citizen Kane, The Flying Ambersons, and It's All True, none of which made it in on time, none of which made it in under budget, and none of which did any good at the box office. So RKO wants their money. And so far, Wells has not been profitable, so they really come down on him and pressure him hard to make sure that this film comes in on time, comes in under budget, and is mainstream enough to make some cash at the box office. So they present this extremely restrictive contract to Wells, and he takes it, much to their surprise. Um, so uh, what happens is not only does he agree to the budget and time constraints, but he gives up creative um, say. Uh, the, the studio has final say over any creative disputes, including the editing of the film, which was unlike anything Wells had ever done before. Wells was quite famous for being very controlling and taking care of multiple roles or being directly involved with all of the steps of making of his films. So uh, one of the things that he agreed to is to work with an outside editor. So enter RKO sends in, enter Ernest J. Supercutter Nims. I'm not making that up, that's what they called him, Supercutter. This guy had been cranking out cookie cutter westerns one ride after the other, uh, and was a machine. He was notorious for leaving a lot on the cutting room floor. So as a result, when he got done with The Stranger, it was 30 minutes shorter than when he got it. Uh, he cut 19 minutes from the first two reels, which is half of the first two reels almost, something to that effect. Um, what he cut out, though, it turns out, is that a big part of the manhunt of following the Nazi war criminal guy took place as they come and journey north up through South America and Mexico. It included multiple agents, one of them is killed, uh, all kinds of other stuff. So we only get a little tiny taste of that, enough to know that it occurred, and that's it, because the movie, the real meat and potatoes of the movie, takes place in the town of Connecticut. Uh, tragically, all that cut footage was lost uh, after having watched the film multiple times. As much as I'd like to see it, I don't think it would have improved the film any at all. It would have simply been a really cool extra on the Blu-ray or something, you know. Well, meanwhile, unbeknownst to RKO and their pressure on, and them pressuring Orson Welles, uh, meanwhile, International Pictures wants Welles. So they offer Wells this five-picture deal, which was pretty sweet in 1946, especially to a director who hadn't really shown to be very profitable. But just like RKO, International Pictures told him they'd like to see him get this one in on time and on budget and hopefully at least be a reasonable commercial success before they let him sign on this five-picture deal. And that is why he was so willing to do it for RKO. It's a win-win. If Orson can play nice, he gets out of the one and into, the, into a better contract and so forth and regains creative control of his work with International Pictures. So the final result is fantastic. It turns out that a reined-in Orson Welles is a much um, more coherent Orson Welles. The film is really fantastic, it's well paced, and there are some really great stuff in it, yet it doesn't get down the usual side trails and so forth that a lot of Wells' movies do. So, I'm really glad that you're here watching this with me. So when I come back, 
I'll talk about what an incredible cast this has. It's really a rich cast. So we'll go down one by one and introduce you to each of the characters and so forth. And uh, we'll see you when I get back. Look, here is the new Band-Aid plastic strip with new Super Stick. It sticks better than any other bandage. The proof? Take a dry egg at room temperature. Touch the egg with any other bandage. Brand X, brand Y, brand Z. Not one sticks. But a Band-Aid plastic strip with new Super Stick sticks tight instantly. Watch it again in slow motion. No pressure, yet we can lift the egg, even boil it. And the Band-Aid plastic strip never comes loose. Maybe you don't want to broil eggs this way, but you do want the extra protection of Band-Aid plastic strips. They take better care of little cuts and scratches. They stay put. Yes, even in hot, soapy dishwater. Neat, flesh-colored, almost invisible. Band-Aid plastic strips with new Super Stick stick better than any other bandage. Made only by Johnson & Johnson, the most trusted name in surgical dressings. Be sure you get Band-Aid plastic strips. That's all there is to it. Let him escape. In my view, it's all very irregular. It might entail the most embarrassing repercussion. Exactement. Certainly. It's the responsibility of the first magnitude. I'm sorry, Mr. Wilson, but you oh, must blast leave. all this discussion. What good are words? I'm sick of words. Hang the repercussions and the responsibility. If I fail, I'm responsible. Leave the cell door open. Let him escape. Let him. It's our only chance. Uh, well, sure. You can threaten me with the bottom bits of hell. And still, I insist, this obscenity must be destroyed. You hear me destroy! Todos los pasajeros desembarquen. All passengers ready to disembark. I'm traveling for my health. I'm traveling for my health. Tengan listos sus pasaportes. Get your passports ready. I'm traveling for my health. I don't understand. You business in this country, senora. I'm joining my husband. Next, Come please. please. Stepan Polaski. Your business in this country, senor. I'm traveling for my health. How? <clears throat> I am traveling for my health. Oh. You are a native of what country? Oh. Oh. Hold on. Next, please. Para que viene usted a este país, senor?
¿Qué pasó? Yo lo voy a seguir a pie, tú vete en el carro. Ah, bien. Hotel Nacional, 7702. Hello. Yes. You haven't lost him. You sure you know where he's going? My wife is following him. He's gone to the photographers, probably to get a new passport and new instructions. Hold it. Ah. I wish to know the whereabouts of Franz Kindler. Franz Kindler. There is no Franz Kindler. Franz Kindler is dead. And cremated. It's a command! I have a message for Franz Kendrell. From the old heist. It, it is forbidden. I command you in the name of that authority. Connecticut. In the United States, the town of Harper. It's just down the road here, please. Yeah. This way, mister. Yes, thank you. Thank you. 
I may come in? Yes, of course. Does Mr. Charles Rankin live here? Yes, he does, but he isn't here right now. You expect him? Yes, in a few minutes. How soon? Well, a few minutes. I may... <clears throat> I may wait here. Well, yes, if you like. Would you like to sit down? Thank you. You a friend of Mr. Rankin? Yes, a friend. Uh, I'm Mary Longstreet. How do you do? How do you do? Mr. Rankin ought to be here now. Sometimes he stays after his last class, but he'll be coming straight here today, I'm sure. Because this is our wedding day. You are getting married? Yes, at 6 o'clock. I know it's most unconventional, my being here today, but I want to get these curtains up. When he comes, which way does he come? My, uh... From uh, Web Webster Hall. It's, it's the big dome building right over there, you see? I shall meet him. Well, who shall I say that go... Frank. It's I, Frank. Frank, again. we mustn't be seen talking together. Go back to the church, into the woods. Into the woods, you understand? Follow the path. I'll meet you there. Hello, Professor Rankin. Mr. Hello, Rankin. man. What are you up to? Paper chase. Oh, paper chase. I go ahead and lay the trail. You ought to have Jerry's job, Mr. Rankin. Take a little off that waist slide. <laughs> no, you ought to go with us, Mr. Rankin. Well, where to? The Hiya, woods. Blondie. Oh, The woods. Well, I, I'd like to. I'm afraid I have a couple of things to attend to. Well, join us later. We'll be out till dark. All right. Well, we'll catch up with you. Yes, Meineke. I thought I had been hanged. Hmm. The others, but not I. A dead man could not stand face to face with you, Franz. You're not much changed. But you're back in your old uniform. Very much the same. Franz, I am a different man than before. I too. I too am different, Conrad. I... You know how I gathered and destroyed every single item in Germany and Poland that might have served as a clue to my identity. Well, guess what I'll be doing at 6 o'clock tonight? Standing before a minister of the gospel with a woman's hand in mine, a daughter of a justice of the United States Supreme Court, a famous liberal. The girl's even good to look at. Yes, the camouflage is perfect. Who would think to look for the notorious Franz Kindler in the sacred precincts of the Harper School, surrounded by the sons of America's first families? And I'll stay hidden. Till the day when we strike again. France. There will be another war? Of course. War is an abomination, save the Lord. It is to tell you this that I am here. He set me free that I set might you come free. here and tell. Who set tell you this free? To you. The whole lies. You don't mean? I mean God. Franz, I'm a new man since I found you. You, Conrad, a religious. Franz, Franz, all doors were open to me. All doors. It was one of God's miracles. Mm -hmm. They freed you, so you'd lead them to me. Have you been followed? 
We followed here. Yes. Who followed you? The evil one. He looked like any other man. He was, he was dressed like any other man. He even smoked a pipe. But I recognized him through his disguise. And I killed him. Striking from on high down. That's will be done. You killed him, the man with the pipe? The man who followed you? No one else followed you? You must be brought to salvation, Franz. Confess your sins as I have. Proclaim your guilt. Only thus you can attain salvation. You really think so, Conrad? It will take strength. Hmm. Such strength as can come only from God. Kneel by me, friends. And together we will pray to him to give you strength. I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I am not worthy to be called thy son. Say these words after me. I despair of my sins. I despair of my sins. Oh, God of all goodness. How oh God. could I ever have offended thee? Of all goodness. <laughs> Beloved, we are gathered together here in the sight of God and in the face of this company to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony. Forsaking all others, keep the only unto her so long as ye both shall live. I will. Mary, wilt thou have this man for thy wedded husband to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? Wilt thou love him, comfort him, honor and keep him in sickness and in health, and forsaking all others, keep the only unto him so long as ye both shall live? I will. Now what? Now let's check the second message. Ready. Mum, the doctor's deodorant discovery now contains M3. Got that? M3 to stop odor 24 hours a day. Remember now. I know. For security reasons, mum's the word. 
New Mum Cream Deodorant now with M3. Got the message? Wow, what a start to a film, huh? Everything is set up. We know who the players mostly are, and we know where they are, and we know that we're all in this same little town, and that certainly a cat and mouse game is about to unfold, right? What a great cast this is for the film. Let's take a look and see who they are. Um, let's start out with Loretta Young and Richard Long as the brother and sister Longstreet, uh, the leads in this film. Uh, they represent your Norman Rockwell, uh, American Dream, vanilla, suburban house family, right? Um, they are just your clean-cut American kids, right? Even though they're pretty old in this film to be portrayed as the youth that they are. One of them still in school and the other one about to be married off. Um, but they are perfectly cast for this, too. Uh, both of them had done long, had long careers in films with playing lots of clean-cut good characters. Uh, Richard Long is probably best known still today as, his, uh, as the son in the Ma and Pa Kettle series. Um, and later on, he made a great transition from film acting into tel television. Uh, he did uh, about a seven-year stretch or so, give or take, on Maverick, and then another really long stretch on The Big Valley. Both were very popular television westerns. Uh, Loretta Young, she always got typecast into the roles pretty similar to this one. Her best feature is that upturned, innocent gaze, right? which is perfect for what they needed here. Um, later in her career, she uh, eventually, she also made the transition to television with a long running, very popular show, The Loretta Young Show, where she was a host and she hosted a drama anthology series. Sometimes she starred in it, sometimes she even directed, uh, but it was a week to week drama that was just one episode at a time, much like what we think of uh, from the Twilight Zone or um, Tales from the Crypt as being anthology shows, but this was drama. Kind of, uh, think of the Lifetime channel before there was a Lifetime channel, right? Hitting that same kind of demographic. But it was very popular. Um, when The Stranger got filmed, though, um, Hollywood considered her a little old for the part. So um, they're trick to that was to only film her from her left side, her left profile, every time. And now that I've pointed that out, it'll become painfully obvious to you. Um, I kind of blame Supercutter Nim for that, uh, because I'm sure that Orson Welles shot from 17 different angles. He just happened to only put in all the ones from her left side, I think. Um, character actor Philip Merivale. Uh, who plays the judge and father to Mary and Noah, uh, Loretta Young, and uh, Richard Long's characters. Uh, he had a very busy but a short career. Um, he's probably most well-known for this film and Alfred Hitchcock's Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Sadly enough, though, uh, Merivale died in March of 1946, and The Stranger wouldn't even be released until July like four months later. So chances are good he may not have ever even seen the finished product. How about that performance from Konstantin Shane? Holy cow. Born in Russia in an area we now call the Ukraine, he played tons of roles as Germans and Russians, officers, agents, bad guys, villains, heavies. He was that go-to guy if you needed that accent right? Um, he had the look and he had the sound. I absolutely love his performance here. Oh, by the way, he turns out a really great performance in uh, Hitchcock's Vertigo as well. But in this one, I love his performance in this as the Christian zealot, former Nazi uh, officer. He travels halfway around the world not to find his guy, his former boss, to be back Nazis again or whatever, but he finds him to try to save his soul. Um, I find that so weird and ironic for the film. He comes back offering 
forgiveness and redemption to uh, Franz Kindler, but Kindler neither wants nor feels either one of those things. Um, and I think it's also to show us what a monster Kindler is, because how does he react to this message of love and forgiveness that this guy went to so much trouble to bring him? He kills him, buries him in a shallow grave in the woods. So we get to see that not only is the Nazi still a Nazi, but he's just a really rotten guy, you know? Um, you know, Constantine may have only gotten the first 15 minutes of the film, but wow, what an impact he made on the film, right? However, though, as good as that was, my personal favorite performance is Billy House as Mr. Potter, the checker hustling store owner of uh, town gossip. I love his performance. He does the entire film sitting down, but yet he's possibly one of the most animated characters in the movie. He is constantly shuffling his hat and ringing the cash register for emphasis and fiddling with the checkerboard and shifting around. It's, it's, he reminds me a lot of Floyd the Barber from the Andy Griffith show a little bit in his, oh yes, his surprise at everything and stuff. I just love this. Watch Billy House's great performance. Um, also to note, I don't want to spoil anything, but the checker games are very symbolic for what's happening in the film and even foreshadow some events and stuff. So it's worth paying attention to because to, the crafting of this film is, is outstanding in, in areas like that. Um, what can I say about Edward G. Robinson, the fantastic, the legendary Edward G., immortalized in film and even Looney Tunes, right? Um, I feel like he really underplays this role here. He's doing this very subtle, very quiet. Uh, he does more with the space between his lines than he does with his actual lines, right? Um, now, I know it's written that way because that's his, the investigator style of drawing people out when he talks to them. You'll see as the film unfolds. But I'm telling you, Robinson does more with his pipe or his coat or a look, an eyebrow, than he does with any of the line delivery in this. Um, of course, Edward G. Robinson is best known for playing gangsters. Uh, his breakout performance in Little Caesar, and later one of my favorite films, uh, Key Largo. Uh, he's particularly menacing in that one. And while he could be very menacing on screen, in real life, he was apparently the nicest guy ever. Um, a well-known and outspoken pacifist, he spoke eight languages, he collected fine art, enjoyed fine cigars and brandies, and uh, was a very snappy dresser. I, I recommend looking him up. Um, and uh, just all around sweet, friendly dude. However, um, because of his outspoken political beliefs, he was gray listed during the McCarthy area. Lost a lot of work. We didn't get to see him for quite some time. But eventually he returned to Hollywood and working. Um, and in his final performance in 1973, in the sci-fi classic, Soylent Green, he turns out another outstanding performance, complete with one of the most memorable death scenes on film, in my opinion. Um, he never got an Academy Award for anything that he did. So two or three years after he died, the Academy gave him a Lifetime Achievement Oscar, posthumously. A little too late there, guys, but he really was quite a legend. I highly recommend you look for his films and look him up online to see what kind of person he was. Um, when I come back, I'll tell you who Orson Welles wanted to play the part of the investigator and why it would have made this an outstandingly groundbreaking film. Afternoon. Wedding? Yep. Judge Longstreet's daughter. He's Supreme Court Justice, you know. Bottle of aspirin, please. Right back there. Third shelf down at the top. 
You see the big ones on the left, the economy size. You have to get it yourself, mister. Right oh. back there. <laughs> All your needs are on our shelves. Just look around and help yourselves. Right in there, right this one. That's, that's it, that's it. Living down to Mrs. Peabody? Just a few days only. Uh, some coffee, too, please. Or should I get it myself? Cafeteria style around here. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Self-service. The usual thing. Yes, that's, that's three dollars even, Mr. Todd. <laughs> no limit on the cream. But all the people around here take it black. Miss Longstreet Mary, one of the teachers down at school. A stranger in town. I issued the license. Oh. Yep. I'm town clerk. Yeah. Uh, checkers? All right. Town clerk, huh? Yep. Well, that must be quite a responsibility. Oh, town clerk runs the town, you might say. We usually make it for uh, 15, 20. We often play as high as 25 cents a game. Well, that's kind of stiff for me, but I'll take a flyer. Make a million, lose a million. <laughs> that's the way it goes. <laughs> I move. Hmm? All right. Well, you must uh, know just about everybody in town here. Not just about. Know everybody. You're on business? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. School business? Oh. No, no. Selling something? Oh. No, no. Buyer. Oh, antique dealer. They all come to Harker. Judge Longstreet's got the best collection in these parts. Won't do you no good, though. No, I don't suppose he'd sell. Happen to know there are any other out-of-town buyers here? Uh, let me see. Come to think of it, there's a fellow come in this morning. Yeah? Came on the same bus with you. Yeah. Left a suitcase here, never did come back for it. He, he might have been one of them. Uh, no. Oh, he was more of a missionary type. Wasn't in here but a minute, just looked in the phone book. Tiny little fellow he was, uh, uh, thinnish. Uh, unfortunate looking. Hurt your head, mister? No, uh, uh, no, no, nothing serious. Oh, that's too bad. It's a game you got to keep your mind on. Ah, 25 cents, please. I won't pretend I'm not disappointed. Hello, yet. Father. Has anybody seen my brand new husband? Don't tell me he's deserted you already. Yes, looks as if the brute. <laughs> Listen, Red, have you seen Charles? No, you go find him for me. Go on, go on, go find Charles. Hurry up. I've looked everywhere for him, Mary, and I can't find him. Well, I wonder where he could be. I'm getting worried. Are you, darling? What about? Charles, you've changed. Don't you think you'd better? After all, aren't we supposed to be going on a honeymoon or something? Give me five minutes.
Was that you working up there on the clock? No. No, I was just cleaning around it. Oh, it's a beautiful thing. What I can see out front. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, my name's Wilson. Oh, I'm Longstreet. No, Longstreet. Oh, I'm glad to know you. I uh, couldn't judge any too well out front, but I'd say it was uh, late 16th century, probably by Hobrecht of Strasbourg. Uh, the clock. Well, uh, I wouldn't know. My brother-in-law is going to work on it. Is he up there now? No, no. He's on his honeymoon. He plans to work on it when he gets back. Oh. Is he an expert? Well, yes, but it's really more of a hobby with him. Really? <laughs> well, it is with me, too. Honeymoon? Yeah. He and my sister. Um, he has to be back on Friday because of the examinations. Oh. Uh, he's one of the teachers at the school. Uh, his name is Rankin. Oh. It's nice to be able to show it to someone who knows what Revere Silver's all about. Mm. But personally, my specialty is pewter. Oh, yes, uh, pewter. Now, uh, the uh, Revere workmanship, although uh, uh, sometimes heavy in design, almost invariably shows the sign of a master craftsman. It's, it's beautiful. Noah. Hello. Mary. Hello, honey. Hello, oh, Mary, Adam. dear. <laughs> Mr. Wilson, my daughter, Mary. Oh, how do you how do, do, you do? Wilson, my son-in-law, Charles Rankin. How do you do? Yeah. How do you do? I hope well, you don't mind my intruding on your homecoming. Good evening, Mary. <laughs> Jeff, how are you? Fine. You're looking good. Oh, Welcome home, home, Miss Mary, dear. Sarah. Sarah. Oh, oh, Sarah. Oh, Sarah. Oh, Sarah. If you don't oh, sit down, it'll oh, get cool. Come on, Jen. Well, sister, how are the mountains? They were perfect and marvelous. Uh, Mr. Wilson, yes, will you come sit over here on my right? Jeff, right. your usual place, darling. Right. You're right there. You ought to see Charles on skis. He's absolutely oh. wonderful. Yes, no. darling, you are, and I'm pretty good, too, aren't I? Very. Well, for a beginner. Yes, you've got to keep your knees together and your apparatus in. <laughs> Mr. Wilson here is compiling a catalog of Paul Revere Silver. How nice. Mr. Wilson is also an authority on clocks. Oh, really? That's Charles' hobby, too. Yes, though, your brother tells me. I understand you're going to fix the one in the church tower. Well, I may try. No, oh, it's quite an undertaking. Show the kind of a wife I am, I hope he fails. <laughs> I like Harper just the way it is, even with a clock that doesn't run. Have you been at Harper long, Mr. Wilson? Mm, since, uh... Friday, a week ago. Well, you lost the day. I patched you up on Friday. By the way, how's the head? Oh, very much improved, thanks to you, Doctor. You were hurt on Thursday, remember? The day of the wedding. Yes, that's right. Uh, Wednesday, I left Bangor. You were hurt, Mr. Wilson? Oh, nothing serious. <laughs> well, serious enough to raise a bump on his head the size of a billiard ball. The usual door. Good thing you're back, sister. That dog of yours has been inconsolable. <laughs> well, all right, Red. Wait a minute. Here you are. This is for Missy. How's that? Yeah, it's a good boy. How was your meeting, Adam? Oh, irritating. Foreign Policy Association. I read that fellow's report. Standish, has. Yes. I think he's full of prunes. Well, that's the way we used to talk in the 1930s, Noah. Standish? The uh, London Times man of Berlin. Yes, of course, he was quoting rumors, mostly. Men drilling by night, underground meeting places, pagan rituals. Do you believe him, Paul? Well, anything's possible. I'm sorry, sir, but I think it's ridiculous. Huh? Well, there may be some fanatics, but no German in his right mind can still have a taste for war. Do you know Germany, Mr. Rankin? I'm sorry, I... I have a way of making... Enemies when I'm on that subject. I get pretty unpopular. Well, we shall consider it the objective opinion of an objective historian. Historian? A psychiatrist could explain it better. The German sees himself as the innocent victim of world envy and hatred conspired against, set upon by inferior peoples, inferior nations. He cannot admit to error, much less to wrongdoing. Not the German. We chose to ignore Ethiopia and Spain. But we learned from our casualty list the price of looking the other way. Men of truth everywhere have come to know for whom the bell tolled, but not the German. He still follows his warrior gods. Marching to Wagnerian strains, his eyes still fixed upon the fiery sword of Siegfried. And in those subterranean meeting places that you don't believe in, the German's dream world comes alive and he takes his place in shining armor beneath the banners of the 
Teutonic Knights. Mankind is waiting for the Messiah, but for the German, the Messiah is not the Prince of Peace. He's another Barbarossa, another Hitler. Well, then you, uh, you have no faith in the reforms that are being effected in Germany. Well, I don't know, Mr. Wilson. I, I can't believe that people can be reformed except from within. The basic principles of equality and freedom never have, never will take root in Germany. The will to freedom has been voiced in every other tongue. All men are created equal, liberté, égalité, fraternité, but in German... There's Marx. Proletarians unite, you have nothing to lose but your chains. But Marx wasn't a German, Marx was a Jew. But my dear Charles, if we concede your argument, there is no solution. Well, sir, once again, I differ. Well, what is it, then? Annihilation. Time of the last babe in arms. Charles, I can't imagine you're advocating a Carthaginian peace. Well, as an historian, I must remind you that the world hasn't had much trouble from Carthage in the past 2,000 years. Well, there speaks our pedagogue. Uh, speaking of teachers, Mr. Wilson. Yes, yes. The faculty is coming for tea next Tuesday. If you have nothing better to do, would you like to join us? Uh, I'd like to, but uh, my work here is finished. I'm leaving Harper tomorrow. Extraordinary, isn't it? Clock being Mr. Wilson's hobby, too. Yes, isn't it? Well, Red, how do you like your new house? He loves it. Come here, Red. I think I'll take you for a walk. Come here, boy. Oh, darling, you don't have to take him out. Just let him out. He won't run off. All right. I need to walk. I'm restless. Come on, boy. That's good. How are you coming along? I'll be in Washington tomorrow afternoon. You were right about Rankin. He's above suspicion. Coming long distance. Uh, I want Washington, D.C. Well, who but a Nazi would deny that Karl Marx was a German because he was a Jew? I think I'll stick around for a while. Dear, I told you about him. He came here the day we were married. Light me a cigarette, would you? No, I've never had a dream like that before. It's 
frighten me. Thanks. You know, that little man was walking all by himself across a deserted city square. Wherever he moved, he threw a shadow. But when he moved away, Charles, the shadow stayed there behind him and spread out just like a carpet. It... I wish you could think who he might have been. You're overtired. Yeah, perhaps. Here, dear, put this out, will you? Cellar. Oh, darling, no wonder he's howling. He's never been locked up in his entire life. Friends to live with us, he must be trained. At night, he will sleep in the cellar. In the daytime, he'll be kept on a leash. Charles, I don't believe in dogs being treated like prisoners. Maybe it's my dog. Please, Mary. I know it's best. Home, city howls all night. Oh. Uh, fishing any good in these parts? Pretty fair. Would you like to come along? I'm uh, afraid I've got the wrong clothes on, but the fish probably won't mind. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm just not lucky today, that's all. Would <laughs> you like a candy bar? Well, I don't mind if I do. Thank you. All your folks like fishing? Oh, my dad's great. He always brings in something. Well, what about Charles? Charles? Oh! <laughs> I have to call him Mr. Rankin at school. I get a little mixed up sometimes. <laughs> uh, he spends most of his time on the clock, you know. Why don't you like him, Noah? What do you mean? Well, you don't like your brother-in-law. It's none of my business, but uh, I wish you'd tell me why. Well... I like him well enough. I don't know any reason why I shouldn't. Don't tell me I'm butting in because I know I am, but I can't help myself. It's my business. I hate bringing you into this, Noah, but you're the only one I can turn to. I need your help very badly. Well, what is it? Your sister may be in great trouble. I know that you're man enough for what I'm going to ask you to do for her. The truth is, I'm... Not really an antique dealer. I'm a sort of a detective. Well, what do you want me to do, Mr. Wilson? It would help me a lot if I knew every move Charles Rankin made on the day of his wedding, right up to the ceremony. Well, I should be able to, unless Charles realizes what I'm doing. I'll keep him busy. Gee, Mr. Wilson, you must be wrong. Mary wouldn't fall in love with that kind of a man. I hope I am wrong, Noah, but that's the way it is. People can't help who they fall in love with. Evening, Mr. Potter. Evening, Mr. Wilson. Here you and Professor Ankton uh, aim to fix the clock. That's right. Mm. Figured to tell time right now? 
Will the angel circle around the belfry? Is that a man or a woman angel, Mr. Wilson? I don't know. Well, I reckon it don't make much of a difference amongst angels. <laughs> well. Give up? No, 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 no. We'll, we'll play it out. Uh, that's my privilege, 25 cents. Yeah. So, uh, by the way, that uh, Mr. Rankin pick up his supper this evening? Yeah. No. Nope. He's got to get Stu up there about now. Mm. Yes, I know. It's dark early these days. <laughs> Our little man never did pick up a suitcase, did he? Nope. Strange. Ain't it, though? Hmm? I've been tempted once or twice to look to see what's inside it. Maybe it's locked. Well, it seems to me that under the circumstances that you have a perfect right. You do? Uh, well, I wouldn't want to do it without a witness. Oh, that's me. It is? That's all I wanted to know. I'm trying to look in that thing and see if it's in there. <laughs> Wonder what's in it. Soil in him. Sweater. Soap and a razor wrapped in a towel with SS Cristobal written across it. A pair of old shoes. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing but religious pamphlets. Yeah, that's all. Good evening, Mr. Potter. Oh. oh hello, Mr. Wilson. Potter? Wilson, hi. You, Mr. Rankin. Uh, Mr. Potter and I have been poking our noses into somebody else's business. Yeah, that suitcase. Yeah. That chap left it here and he never did call back. That's been more than two weeks ago. Did he say what he was doing in the office? No. Looked in the phone book. Didn't telephone. Kind of funny looking he was. A scrawny little fella with big, starry blue eyes. Had a queer walk. Like any second, he might break into a run. Did he have a foreign accent? Why, yes, he did. Uh, but not so much of an accent as a foreign way of talking. Do you happen to know who he could be, Mrs. Rankin? Why, why, no. I was just trying to complete your mystery for you. Don't all foreign strangers have to have foreign accents? Mary, have you seen Red? I know. Not since I took him home to you a couple of days ago. Well, he's been spending all his time out in the woods and he doesn't even come home for his meals. But you told me he never ran away. He never did. No, that's why Noah's so anxious. Come on, Mary. Good night, Mr. Wilson. Good night. Good night, Noah. Good night. Q, what's cooking with you? Your teeth look whiter than new, new, new. My teeth aren't new, but my toothpaste is new Pepsodent. Get with it, kids. New package, new flavor, new formula, too, means brighter smile for me and you. You'll wonder where the yellow went when you brush your teeth with Pepsodent. The new formula with IMP gets teeth much whiter. You can see it cleans the stains and film away while Erium fights tooth decay. You'll wonder where the yellow went when you brush your teeth with Pepsodent. The taste is new, so fresh and clean. That new taste really lasts, it's keen. And while it makes your smile a rave, it also makes your breath behave. So start going steady right away with Pepsodent. Get some today. You'll wonder where the yellow went when you brush your teeth with Pepsodent. Pepsodent, Pepsodent. Hughes, famous flyer and sportsman, was dragged out of this wreckage of an experimental plane he was testing. He was seriously injured. After ripping the corner from two homes in Beverly Hills, California, the plane finally plunged into this house. The force of the impact virtually wrecked the building and caused the plane to catch fire. The flyer said that the accident was due to motor failure shortly after his takeoff. He failed to make a crash landing on a golf course. 
Dennis O'Keefe, film actor, inspects damage done the home of Lieutenant Colonel Myers, chief interpreter at the Nuremberg War Trials. America's aviation trailblazers willingly pay the price in man's conquest of the air. If anything happens to that dog, I'm out of here. So we're seeing Kindler begin to unravel a little bit. You can tell he's stressed, and his wife is starting to look at him like, uh, hey, maybe this isn't the guy I thought he was. Um, despite the fact Kindler, you know, is two moves ahead and knows that she's a threat, uh, Wilson is now on to him and understands that, you know, people around him may be in jeopardy now. Uh, Wilson buys into the dinner conversation about the annihilation of the Germans and how they're unremorseful and all that that Kindler was putting out. Uh, he totally bought it, hook, line, and sinker. Even went back to his place and called up Washington and said he would be there in the morning and that Kindler was above reproach. But he lays down and in the dark of the night, bam, sits up in bed with that great revelation of where Kindler had tripped up in his conversation. Um, I do love how there's almost this supernatural element to the film. It's like, uh, well, we get the uh, Kindler's out in the woods and he kicks the dog and that's the moment that Wilson sits up in bed. And then later when Kindler comes home and wakes up his wife, she talks about a nightmare she had about the little foreign man, Meineke, and how his, his, he went away but his shadow stayed and spread out over everyone. What a great metaphor, right? But it gives kind of a creepy dread feeling to the film uh, without it actually being supernatural, and I really like that. Um, I did promise to tell you about the casting choice that Orson Welles had made for the film to play the part of Inspector Wilson. Uh, RKO shot it down, but of course they were looking to make a commercial film. You know, they were looking to make a little money at the box office, they weren't looking to break any new ground because Wells wanted his longtime friend and co-worker, Agnes Moorhead. That's right, Agnes Moorhead. She had been a regular um, actress that worked uh, on with Wells in the Mercury Theater days, and then later as he transitioned to radio and started the Mercury Theater radio, uh, she was a regular cast there and did a lot of voice acting and so forth for the radio station. Um, she would have been great. I can totally see her in the part of the War Crimes Commission. Um, I did a little looking and this would have been a really breakout thing. This would have been a super important film had she gotten the role because prior to this women just didn't get cast as the smart, intelligent, I don't need to be saved by a man lead. Um, prior to this probably the boldest uh, film portrayals of women had been uh, Barbara Stanwyck and Babyface in the early 30s. Uh, that one explored uh, women's sexual freedoms and so forth, whatnot. Um, and then uh, we had, uh, of course, Katherine Hepburn doing several films uh, with Cary Grant uh, when she was, she was super smart and, you know, outgoing and a very big part of those movies. But still, she was kind of cast as a little bit of a sidekick to Cary Grant. Um, and of course, I didn't know about this, but there was a series of films in the late 30s called the Torchy Blaine series. And Torchy Blaine was an ongoing character um, that was a plucky, independent, headstrong reporter that out on the beat that would get involved in these crimes and murders and whatnot and then solve them. And... Uh, all of that. She was super smart, super athletic, and, you know, there to save the day. However, in true Hollywood fashion, a lot of times she ended up captured by the villains and rescued by the police bursting in at the end and so forth. Um, so I really like to wonder how it would have changed the movie or affected its popularity if Moorhead had actually gotten the part. What I do know is that it would have been a landmark movie for representation of women in film. Uh, good for Orson Welles for, uh, for wanting to make such a bold choice. 
and too bad to RKO for not. Um, so, without any further ado, let's get back to the second half of The Stranger from 1946. Look at me. Your father was a nobody, a middle hand. The best thing he ever did for you was to die. Can you get you out of it? Special privileges in this hotel, Sam. I own it. It's Ms. O'Neill, Tony. Hello. You sound like you're in love with her. You sound like you're jealous. Could be. Poor little Martha. Her life was so empty. Is that what she told you, Sam? Whatever happens to you, you've got coming. What can happen, Sam? Oh, Sam, it can be so easy. Anything? Lanneke did go to Rankin's house. And your sister did see him. Did Mary say so? She started to. Now, your sister is a fine woman, Noah. But she must find out the kind of man she's married to. You don't know Mary. She, she wouldn't listen to anything against him. Much less believe. Noah, we must arrange it so that she finds out for herself. Do you understand? One thing certain, she knows nothing now, nothing at all. Except that he didn't want her to admit having seen someone she did see. I'd give something to know what explanation he's making right now. I was a student in Geneva. There was a girl. The night before I was to leave, we went out on the lake together. She told me unless I promised to marry her, she'd never return to shore. I thought she was joking, naturally, but she wasn't. Before I could stop her, she stood up in the boat. Well, I, I dived in after her, but it was too late. She was gone. Only one person knew we were on the lake together, her brother. He knew I hadn't murdered her, but he, he told me he'd be willing to call it an accident for her. I gave him all I had and left Switzerland. As the years went by, I allowed myself to believe that the dead past really was dead. And then, on our wedding day, Mary, he appears again. Her brother, the little man. I gave him all the money I had in the world. And he went away again. You should have told me. You have not carried this, this awful thing around by yourself. You're a very wonderful person, Mary. And I love you very much. Oh, child. Why didn't he go back for his things? Well, I suppose once he had money, he could, he could afford better. Darling, I'm, I'm terribly nervous. I think I'll work up in the clock alone tonight by myself. 
It will calm me. You understand, don't you? Of course I understand. Shall I walk you home? No, dear, there's no need for that. Pretty late. That's all right. In Harper, there's nothing to be afraid of. heard my whistle, I'll bet. He couldn't bark or anything. He just crawled this far and died. Why do you think he died? Let's go and find out. That's young Longstreet's dog, Red. Looks like he's dead to me. Yeah. They're, they're taking him up to... Dr. Lawrence's office. Would you know anything about it? I wonder if, what the world's the matter with him. Uh, checkers? No, no, thank you. That coat's a nickel. Thank you, Mr. Rankin. Uh, how long could the dog have lived with that amount of poison in it? Oh, not more than a minute or so, I think. Well, then Red must have been poisoned within a few hundred yards of where you found him, Noah. And the latter part of the distance, he must have been moving slower and slower. Thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you, Jeff. Mr. Peabody, would you please get that magazine rack in and hurry up about it? Yes, Mr. Potter. Yeah. Hurry up about it. Going Move along and... Uh, afternoon, Mr. Wilson. Afternoon, Noah. Bring him right in there. say about this kind of murder is it the same as killing a man it ought to be it's just as bad four paws muddy no mud on hind dry leaves mixed with the mud red must have been digging somewhere in the woods have you any idea what for mr wilson the body i think in any case the little man. Then. Just caught me. Anything wrong? Wrong? Oh, you mean floating up like this? Yeah. Just going on a search. What you after? Found a machine oil. What search? It's for the body. State police deputized half the town. Just reach up there, poor chap. Oh, and this is the news over the clock tower. What body are they searching for? I bet this fella left his bags here. Sprawly little Dutch. Unhappy looking. <laughs> I knew he'd come to a bad end. That ought to be 15 cents, Mr. Professor, I'll just put it on your account. Toby, you're up here. Well, why are you packing? Are we going somewhere? We aren't, dearest. I am. What are you talking about? As a rule, men leave their wives because they don't love them. But I must leave you because I do. Oh, you won't object once you know the kind of man you marry. But you are the man I have married, and that's all that matters. Darling, I meant it when I said for better, for worse. Even to... to killing Red. <laughs>
Murder can be a chain, Mary, one link leading to another until it circles your neck. Red was digging at the grave of the man I killed. Yes, your little man. You killed him? With these hands. The same hands that have held you close to me. Now, are you satisfied to let me go? But why? Why did you do it? I'd have given him all I had, but his dreams were far grander. He knew that your father was well to do. He knew that Justice Longstreet would be glad to protect his daughter from any scandal by paying a few thousand dollars. Oh, Mary, I, I should have gone away and lost myself in a world where he can never find me, but I loved you, and I was weak. Dad? If one of us goes, we'll both go. You would have shared half my trouble if I'd had any. Charles, what is there to connect you with that man? Nothing, actually. You're the only one that knows I knew him. Well, then you need have no fear. If I'm the only one who can speak. But Mary, in failing to speak, you become part of the crime. But I'm already a part of it. Because I'm a part of you. And you shudder at the first touch of my hands as though it was the touch of death. Nerves. Oh, hold me close, Charles. Hold me close. Mr. Peabody, go back to town with the sheriff and open up the coroner's office. Yes, I knew sir. darn well it wasn't the same color. Of course, he's changed some. Uh, being buried in the earth, does it? Evening, Mr. Wilson. Evening, Mr. Potter. Evening, Noah. <laughs> Evening, Mr. Potter. Mess, ain't it? What do we do about Mary? We can't leave her alone with him now that we know. Well, she realizes now that whatever story he told her about Meineke was false. Noah, I think your sister should be ready to hear the truth. Charles. Will they make me look at the body? I shouldn't think so. Because I couldn't do it. I mean, I don't think I could. See, I've never seen a dead person. I... Many are having to tea, Mary. 28 altogether, mm -hmm. I have here. You didn't eat nothing at dinner. Isn't that You'll rather a lot? Again, Miss Mary. 28 with just you. Sarah. No, oh, we'll manage all right. I suppose I should. Should what? I don't know. I mean, I'm terrified of seeing anybody or being seen. Mary, I... you must get tight hold of yourself. If you're determined to go through this thing, you must know beforehand exactly what you're going to do and say at all times. Perfect naturalness at all times. Now, darling. to go to the police. It's your father, Miss Mary. He wants to talk to you. Yes, thank you, Sarah. the church and work on the clock while you're with your father. And you can buy and pick me up later. I'm so afraid. So why did this one to see me alone? And his voice sounded so different. And you know what you're going to say, don't you? Something wrong? 
Mr. Wilson is here on a very serious matter. We must try to help him every way possible. He wants to ask a few questions of you. What, what, what do you want to know, Mr. Wilson? You know about the body that was discovered yesterday, Mrs. Rankin? Yes. Did you ever meet the deceased? No, 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 I never met him. Have you seen the body? No. Well, then, uh, how can you be sure you never met him? Of course, I can't be certain. Mr. Wilson, do you suspect me of something? If so, what? Of shielding a murderer. Perhaps this photograph will refresh your memory. Do you recognize this man? That is Conrad Meineke, commander in charge of one of the more efficient concentration camps. You know him, don't you? You have met him here in Harper. No, no. I, I've never seen that man, Mr. Wilson. Uh, Judge, would you mind putting out the lights? I've been showing your father some films, and I'd like you to see them, too. I'm on the Allied Commission for the Punishment of War Criminals. It's my job to bring escaped Nazis to justice. It's that job that brought me to Harper. Surely you don't think that... Mr. Wilson, I've never... I've never so much as even seen a Nazi. Well, you might without your realizing it. They look like other people, and... Act like other people when it's to their benefit. A uh, gas chamber, Mrs. Rankin. The candidates were first given hot showers so that their pores would be open and the gas would act that much more quickly. And this is a lime pit in which hundreds of men, women, and children were buried alive. Why do you want me to look at these horrors? All this you're seeing, it's all the product of one mind. The mind of a man named uh, Franz Kindler. Franz Kindler? Yes, he was the most brilliant of the younger minds from the Nazi party. It was Kindler who conceived the theory of genocide, mass... Why do you want me to look at these horrors? All this you're seeing, It's all the product of one mind. The mind of a man named... Uh, Franz Kindler. Franz Kindler? Yes, he was the most brilliant of the younger minds from the Nazi party. There's no clue to the identity of Franz Kindler, except one little thing. He has a hobby that almost amounts to a mania. Clocks. So have lots of people. You, yourself. Well, I... Uh, I'm not quite finished, Mrs. Rankin. In prison, in Czechoslovakia, a war criminal was awaiting execution. This was Conrad Meineke, one time executive officer for Franz Kindler. He was an obscenity on the face of the earth. The stench of burning flesh was in his clothes. But we gave him his freedom on the chance that he might lead me to Kindler. He led me here, Mrs. Rankin. And here I lost him. Until yesterday. Your dog, Red, found them for me. But unfortunately, Meineke was dead and buried. Now, in all the world, there's only one person who can identify Franz Kindler. That person is the one who knows, knows definitely, who Meineke came to Harbor to see. No, he's not an Nazi. My Charles is not an Nazi. You were at Rankin's house during the afternoon of the day of the marriage. Where? Where? Rankin's house. Oh, yes, yes. Did anyone come while you were there? Not that I remember. Now, try hard to remember. It's not so long ago. Only two weeks. You were hanging curtains. No one came. Were you alone all the time? No. Who else was there? Charles. He came right after his last class. And, and we were together for more than an hour. You, you have nothing to link my husband with this man, Kinder, except a wild suspicion. It's a ridiculous suspicion. You're trying to use me to implicate him, and you can't. You can't involve me in a lie, and that's, that's all it is, is a lie. It's a lie, you know. It's a lie. It's a lie. Mary, Mary. Wait a minute, Mary.
means more to me than anything, don't you? Yes. Yes. You've got to face this thing with complete honesty, sister. Your entire happiness may well depend on your telling me the absolute truth. If Mr. Wilson is right, and you have innocently married a criminal, well, then there is no marriage. There's no call upon your loyalty as a wife. He's good. He's good. He wouldn't hurt any, anybody except to protect somebody he loves. He's, he's good. Well, then the truth can't hurt him. Charles was not with you that afternoon, sister. I remember you saying so when you came home. You're against him no. too, Adam. Yes, you are. You've never liked him. That's why you don't believe me now. Well, leave us alone, Adam. He's not an Nazi. He's not one of those people. He's not. Leave us alone. She has the facts now. But she won't accept them. They're too horrible for her to acknowledge. Not so much that Rankin could be Kindler, but that she could ever have given her love to such a creature. But we have one ally, her subconscious. It knows what the truth is and is struggling to be heard. The will to truth within your daughter is much too strong to be denied. Well, look here, Wilson. If he's not Charles Rankin, we should be able to expose him without too much difficulty. I'm not interested in proving that he isn't Charles Rankin. I'm only interested in proving that he's Franz Kindler. How do you propose to do that? Through your daughter. Unless I'm mistaken, she's headed for a breakdown. That's the usual result of a person being inwardly divided. Rankin will recognize this, and that's what I'm banking on. What do you mean? Well, he can't afford to trust a person approaching hysteria. He won't. He'll have to act. He may try to escape before she collapses, which would only be an admission of guilt. Or, go on, he may kill her. You're shocked at my cold-bloodedness. Well, that's quite natural. You're a father. And it's because you are a father, Judge Longstreet, that I'm talking to you like this. Naturally, we'll try to prevent murder being done. However, the proof that murder is a thing would be the strongest evidence that your daughter could have. I want these curtains drawn. 
I don't like the sunlight streaming in. It's bad for them. Miss Mary, that's rubbish, and you know it. Up at the other house, we never closed the bed. That has nothing to do with it. This is my house, and I want them gone. Well, suit yourself, then. He's going to look mighty gloomy for the party. It's that time already. Were you able to see when they opened the grave, Mr. Randall? Was yes. it too horrible? Well, not the most pleasant sight. Oh, there's Mary. Hello, oh. Mary. Fill out prescriptions. That's part of this business of heat. Sleeping pills, that's another. Dollar <laughs> sixty-five. Okay. One rat? No, thanks. Sleeping pills. Don't approve of them. No. Man does a day's work, man gets a night's sleep. Least ways he could until that clock started bonging every few minutes. I believe Mrs. Rankin uh, ordered some ice cream. Ice they? cream? Yeah. Already gone. Fella said he was going past your house, so I'll give it to him. Yeah. Mr. Wilson. This was not the only film to deal with escaped or post-war Nazis, as it were. Um, Alfred Hitchcock's Notorious uh, dealt with uh, a spy ring in Brazil, and Charles Vidor was directing Rita Hayworth and uh, Glenn Ford in Gilda uh, while they dealt with uh, ex-Nazis as gangsters in Argentina. Both of those films also came out in 1946. But however, this was the first film to use actual footage from the concentration camps in it. Um, Wells had just gotten back from San Francisco before making this movie, where he uh, was working as a correspondent for the New York Post, and he wrote about it in his weekly column. He was so deeply affected by it that he even recommended that everyone see it because it was the only way to make it feel more real to them. He originally included a lot more of the concentration camp footage in The Stranger. Uh, the scene in the library contained several more minutes of it, um, but it was lost to uh, Supercutter Nims on the editing room floor. Um, Wells intentionally made it difficult for them to edit out any of it. He filmed the scenes with uh, Edward G. Uh, in the foreground while the concentration camp footage ran in the background, sometimes even playing across the front of him as he stood in the light from the projector. Uh, so if you noticed maybe in that scene in the library there, the dialogue actually repeats for a little bit. And um, we get like almost a voiceover while Robinson's face is in shadow or while we're getting Loretta Young's face up close with her shocked look while he talks. And that was the only way that Nims could rearrange the scene with less of the Germany footage in it. <clears throat> the Stranger, you see, is kind of a... It's a reflection of what America was kind of dealing with at the time. Um, the war had just ended. The concentration camps weren't revealed until the very end of the war. We had known that the Nazis were bad, but we had not seen anything like this before in modern world. Uh, but now, after peace has broken out, America didn't really know what to do with their enemies. Uh, prior to World War II, the world had been kind of a whole lot of countries living together on the same rock. And nationalism was kind of okay for the day. Uh, after the war, though, three quarters of the world's industrial uh, manufacturing plants lay in rubble. In America, who didn't have any of them lying in rubble, and about a million GIs returning looking for work, were poised to produce most of the goods of the world for a little while. And we found ourselves doing business with countries that we had been carpet bombing only months before. Um, so it was a little difficult for uh, a lot of Americans to swallow, to deal with. And this helps us understand why Kindler's speech at dinner earlier in the film was a plausible cover story a lot of people felt that way about Germany, that they should just be annihilated and rubbed out, that, uh, you know, they didn't have any uh, redeeming qualities anymore. Um, 
Others, like Mary, wanted to see the good in them as humans and believed that they were either coerced or even maybe denied that some of it was real. Uh, and the stranger was shown, without a doubt, that Kindler is still the evilest of the evil. He's manipulative, murderously violent, and a genocidal maniac. Um, but then there's Meineke. Meineke has had a great conversion. He has found redemption and the forgiveness of a higher power, and he travels halfway around the world to share it. And look what it gets him. You know, um, I kind of think that Meineke was the Nazi people like Mary were hoping for. Um, so these are some of the reasons why I see The Stranger as such an important film. Without smacking us in the face, it still addresses some of the really large issues of the time. It doesn't preach. It doesn't even offer its own agenda. It just makes us look at these hard situations through the lenses of different characters. Despite its relevance, the film was not exactly a breakout hit. Uh, Wells managed to complete it in one day, one day ahead of schedule. And uh, not in one day, of course, but he completed it one day early and under budget, which was about a million dollars, a little over, a million three, I think. Well, the film only grossed after a year about three million. And other films similar to, like, say, Hitchcock's Notorious was earning at least five. And the top three grossing films of that year all came in over $20 million. And remember, these are $1946. Uh, so, yeah, it wasn't that great of, a, great of a showing at the box office, but at least paid the bills. Um, as a result, um, International pulled out of that sweet five-picture deal that they offered Wells. So, all of that, uh, that restrictive... Um, contract was to impress them, but didn't work out for him in the end very well, did it? So let's get back to the exciting conclusion of Orson Welles' The Stranger from 1946. You haven't got to feel kind enough to invite me, Mrs. Rankin. No, of course not, Mr. Wilson. Uh, Mr. Potter asked me to deliver this. Oh, the ice cream is good. Sarah's waiting for it. I hope it hasn't melted. Well, I won't detain you any longer. I just... I have a drink for you. Oh, Wilson. just the medicine I need. You know Dr. Hippard? Oh, oh yes, yes, of course. Medicine. How are you, Doctor? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Grandma Lawrence, can I get you something? Oh, nothing more, thank you, dear. Where's Dr. Rankin? Oh, he'll be here in just a few minutes. I want to have a word with him about that clock. Oh, thank you, Grandma. Yes, on my last trip. May I get you some candy? Thank you. And Jack Philippa. And what was that Frenchman's name? Oh, hello, dear. Hello. Lambrou. There may well be ten or a dozen graves out there in the woods. Hey, Lord, that... Or they showed the murder was committed just three weeks ago. May I oh, get you some Oh, thank you, no. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, may I get you another I wish drink? I could remember what Emerson says about crime. Oh, there's Rankin. He may know. Sorry to be late. I'm fine, thank you. Hello, everybody. Darling. Oh. oh, hello there, Rankin. Hi, Mr. Wilson. You know the quotation? Emerson. Quotation? Emerson, the crime and the earth is made of glass. No, I don't. I don't. Uh, commit a crime, and the earth is made of glass. Commit a crime. Commit a crime, and it seems as if a coat of snow fell on the ground, which is reveals in the woods the track of every partridge and fox and squirrel and mole. You cannot recall the spoken word. You cannot wipe out the foot track. You cannot draw up the ladder so as to leave no inlet or clue. You're Mr. Wilson, aren't you? Yes. Do you know you're our number one suspect in our murder case? Oh? So far, you're the only suspect. Potter put the finger on you. He thinks you committed the crime to get possession of some priceless you antique. Want a drink, Mr. Wilson? Mr. Rankin, I wish you'd left that clock alone. Harper was a nice, quiet place until it started banging. Mary, what's Wilson doing here? I don't know. You invited him, didn't you? What's he after? I don't know. Are you all right? 
Yes, quite all right. I remember Friday, Mary. Yes, all right. Good night. Good night. Good night. Can I help you, dear? No. No, no, no. No, no. Mary. No. Mary. It's all right, dear. It broke, and the beads fell all over the floor. He, he took her upstairs. When I left, I could still hear her crying. Well, the floodgates have opened. Her subconscious is almost one. From now on, we must know every move that Mrs. Rankin makes. She's never to leave the house unless I know where she's going. If for any reason I can't be found, she's to be detained, no matter on what pretext. Understand, Sarah. Don't worry. She won't get by me. When she snapped those beads, she signed her own death warrant. We're carrying her life in our hands. Every time she walks on a slippery sidewalk, is near something that can fall, drives an automobile, anything that could result in an accidental death, her life is in danger. She won't get by me. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Yes, sir. Uh, Good afternoon, sir. Today we will attempt to finish with the career of Friedrich the Grosser, König von Preußen, Kurfürst von Brandenburg, Prince von Poland. Frederick the Great, to you. Hello? Oh, Mary. Mary, this is Charles. Can you hear me, dear? I can't speak very loudly where I am, but I want you to understand this. Something very important has come up. You must come to the church immediately. The church tower. You understand? Yes, I understand. I don't want anybody to know that you're going there. Mary, don't tell anybody you're going. Go to the church tower and leave your car in the rear and come in through the back door. Okay. Right. Anybody? They're coming. Well, they're coming. Back. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Back that wood down there for the rest of them, then get back to work. Hey, yes, sir. Watch that, Mr. Peabody. Your move, Betty. Going someplace? Where to? Well, I asked you where you was going, Miss Mary. I heard. Well? Sarah, you seem to forget I'm no longer a child. I'm a married woman. Well, you ain't been married very long. Wait, Mrs. Rankin. What is it? I'm in a hurry. Well, you don't need to go biting my head off. What is it, Sarah? Well, I... <laughs> if you've got something to say, say it. What is it, Sarah? I don't know what's got into you lately. Indeed, I don't. You never was mean to me like this back at the old house. 
Here I am. Maybe I might want my usefulness. I'm not as young as I used to be. Maybe you don't want me around anymore. For heaven's sake, stop talking such nonsense. Well, it's true, and you know it. I'm going to pack my things and leave here. Indeed, I am. <laughs> Sarah, I'm sorry if I've hurt your feelings. I didn't mean to. Really, I didn't. Sarah. Now, I couldn't get along without you, and you know that, don't you? Well, don't you? Uh, honest, Miss Yes, Mary. honestly, honestly, Sarah. Oh, Miss Mary. Oh, Mary. Sarah. Sarah, please, wait just a minute. Sarah, you'll never leave me with them. You know how I feel about you, don't you? Yes, I do. It's like she was my own daughter, yes, my own little girl. How could I? Sarah, I've got to go now. Really, I do. I promised to be somewhere. Well, uh, but, but where to, Miss Mary? Stop fussing, Sarah. It's a secret. Oh, Miss Mary! Oh, 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 oh. What's the matter? Sarah, what's the matter? My heart. What's the I, matter? I can't read. The pain. Oh, no, Miss Mary, please don't leave me. No, no don't leave me. Lie right there and keep quiet. Keep quiet. Now, Maybe I'm dying. You're not dying. Wait. Stay with me. I won't leave you. One three oh, please. Yes, Mary? Uh, look, I was supposed to meet Charles at the clock tower at, right away, and I, I can't get there. Will you go and tell him to please wait for me? And no one, no one's to know where or why you're going. It, it, it's important. All right. Two, three, eight, please. Hello, may I speak to Mr. Wilson? Looks like it's coming up for snow. Yes, Rand, Mrs. Lundstrom, isn't it after hours? You ladies are working too hard at the library. Oh, no, Mr. Rankin. We closed as usual at 3.30. You're perfectly right. I dismissed class 10 minutes early. Yes. That's 3.44. I was playing checkers with Mr. Potter, and I didn't realize. You know what you are, Mr. Rankin. You're the absent minor professor. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Today. I am. You sure are. Good afternoon, Mr. Potter. Good afternoon, Mr. Hill. I'm sorry, Mr. Potter. I can't find them. What? The yearbook. It's yeah, right over there by the mittens. Come on, Mr. Potter. Help us look. Well, I'll be right back in a minute, Professor. Right over there by that box where I told you there was. Those? Yeah, the latest thing out. How much do you want for 85 them? cents. Well, that's an awful lot. Well, they come high this year. You want this thing? Well, I'll keep it. You know, uh, Mr. Potter, you're a bad influence. I, uh, I intended only to spend a couple of minutes. You've made me spend the whole afternoon. Look what time it is. Yeah. I'd like to get even. <laughs> it's your move. You really had the wind up. Golly. You can still smell the glue where he joined it. Look there, Professor. Like I told you, it's coming up for snow. Professor. 
afternoon, Mr. Potter. Charles? No, no, Sarah. Sarah? What about Sarah? Well, just as I was leaving, Sarah had some kind of an attack. Yes, She's right. resting now, yes. And Jess said it wasn't very serious, but that I, I should stay with her. Mm -hmm. What's the matter, Charles? Nothing's the matter. Then why did you want me to go to the church? You said it was important. Important, nothing actual. It's my sense of proportion is failing me these days. Please, Charles, what is? I'm sorry. I've just begun to feel a strain. You see, I have my weak moments too. I'll tell you of my own good. Time. They found out anything more? No, nothing. There's nothing to find out. Unless you. No, no. I haven't seen anybody all day. I've been in my room. There's a rumor going around that there's an arrest to be made. My headaches. The incident of the beads yesterday made me doubt your strength. I thought maybe you'd gone to your father and told him something. If you had. You didn't have to be afraid. No. Why didn't you tell Noah? Hmm? Why, what about? Did you see him? Why should I see no one? Well, did you come here directly from the church? Am I being cross-examined? Oh, no, but when I found I couldn't leave Sarah, I called Noah and told him to go there and tell you I was detained. I told you not to call anybody. Oh, but surely Noah... But... Call him and tell him not to go! Well, I can't. I talked to him over... Call him, I say! He's gone! If he dies, his blood will be on your hands. What are you saying? It's your meddling that's done this. It would have been all right if it was for you. If I let you, you had to be here. On that day... Calling <laughs> Noah! Did you kill Noah? Yes, if he goes to the church and climbs up that ladder! Was I you intended to kill, wasn't it? No. Why wasn't it I? John Skinner! Kill me. Kill me, I want you to. I couldn't face life knowing what I've been to you and what I've done to Noah. But when you kill me, don't put your hands on me. Here! Use this! Mary. Oh. Operator. Uh, operator, get me the uh, state police. Yes, the uh, roadblocks are up. We're watching the railroad station, and he isn't hiding in the woods. Well, if he is what I think he is, it's going to be easy. 
We'll do everything possible to bring her back. She's gone, Mr. Wilson. She's not in the house. Clock tower? I don't know. Well, if that's what he's hiding, if she gets there before us... What do we do? Call Captain Samuels and the deputies. Get all the help you can. Where? Ouch. A church, the church. What about you? I'll get there. Now hurry up now. What do you, your sister may be still alive? You don't need it. I'm alone. What are you doing here? Lift me up. You're telling the truth? Why should I lie? You were followed here? I came by our way. Through the cemetery. No one saw me. I needed the excuse. I was afraid you would let me out. What do you want? I came to kill you. No, no, Mary. It's you that's going to die. You were meant to fall through that ladder. You're going to fall. I don't mind if I take you with me. Search the woods. I watch them. Here, yeah, like gods, looking at the lance. I'll hide in the woods. Don't search there again. A day or two, they'll be sure I got up to town. When they find me, they'll know you're still here. But, darling, you're on the verge of a breakdown. Now you've cracked. Why else would you leave your bed? Come to an empty church door in the dead of night. Any child could see you'd wind up killing yourself. The killing is what led you here. It won't help you now. Look out the window. Look! Well, that's, that's an old trick, Mr. Wilson. A very poor trick. Tricks. That's all you know is tricks. I don't need any tricks. No matter what happens to me, tricks won't do you any good. You're finished, Herr Franz Kindler. <laughs> citizens of Harper. They've come after you. The plain little ordinary people, the ones you've been laughing at, have Franz Kindler. Well, you can't fool them anymore. Oh, sure, you can kill me, Mary, half the people down there. There's no escape. You have the world and it closed in on you till there was only Harper. That closed in on you and there was only this room. And this room, too, is closing in on you. It's not true, the things they said I did. It's all their idea. I followed orders. You gave the orders. I, I only did my duty. Don't send me back to them. I can't face them. I'm not a criminal. You are.
let me give you a hand. No, 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 no thanks. Hi, what happened? Vita and Harper. Don't get that. Come on down. Oh, not until you get me a new ladder. I've had my ankle busted and my head conked. From here on in, my friends, I'm taking it easy. Well, I'll get you another ladder, Mr. Wilson. You've had enough trouble. Good night, Mary. Pleasant dreams. Wow, what an exciting conclusion that was. I love how this film takes a turn and kind of becomes like a monster movie. The, the crowd starts to form of citizens below and law enforcement's showing up. We've got the confrontation with the, the, the monster in the tower. It takes on this real pitchfork and torches kind of feel to it. Uh, and then, of course, we get that dramatic death scene. He gets shot by Mary, of all people. And, of course, you know, this is how her character redeems itself. It kind of had to come full circle that way. She had actually been in cahoots and supported him for a little while. So this was how her character gets back her moral high ground that she began with. And uh, holy moly, he falls out the window, faking us out gets stabbed by the clock, the one thing that he was, you know, he cared about and was trying to fix up. And then the 50-foot fall below. Uh, how how monster movie-ish can you get, you know? And, you know, I loved how well sets us up. He shows us the downward view of that statue tumbling and shattering out on the ground and then immediately shows us Orson Welles falling from the same place. So our brain, with that fresh, shattered image, puts it together with Welles hitting the sidewalk, and it becomes a very visceral and gruesome view without ever showing us actually, you know, any blood or anything. It's a, it's, it's a great technique. Um, speaking of 50-foot falls, the scene where Mary's at the top of the ladder and he has dangling her over the 50 foot drop to the to the floor below by one arm and he stops and he he asks her if she was followed and of course with her innocent upturned face she says you know of course not I wasn't um, that scene was pretty difficult for them to shoot it's a genuine, real 50-foot drop there. Uh, the entire sets, the whole village, or pretty much the town square, the clock tower, and some of the shops, were all built on the back lots at United Artists. Um, Wells wanted the, the tower to be in the background of a lot of the, of the shots. It's always out the window of the shop there where they were playing checkers. When they converse outside, it's in the, the background. And the, it's a bit of foreshadowing for the ending, and it gives kind of this looming sense. But anyway, um, the day of the shot, they put a harness on her with a cable running up the sleeve, and it's a stuntman holding her while Orson Welles directs the film. They do several takes. It's not going well. The cable either is showing in the shot or um, the it's pulling on her sleeve in a, in a weird way, in an unnatural fashion. So in between shots, Loretta Young and the stuntman, unbeknownst to Orson Welles, decide to remove the safety cable. So the very next take they did is the one that's actually in the film. 
because it's real. He really did dangle her out over that 50-foot drop with only their own kung fu grip to save her. And Wells didn't know it, but they got the shot. He hoists her back up. Wells finds out there's no cable, and that's he didn't film another one. So I thought that was a... That was scary, her putting her life on the line like that for the shot. Um, and that look of trust on her face must be genuine, you know. This was Wells' least favorite film. He said that after all the cutting and editing that happened to it, that all traces of him had been removed from it. I beg to differ. Um, this film, to me, has Orson Welles' fingerprints all over it. The long, like, two-and-a-half-minute unbroken shots in, uh, the, the swooping crane movements, uh, the, the weird out-of-context uh, compositions, and um, the uh, half-shadowed faces, low-key lighting, all of that kind of stuff. Um, that makes a film noir a film noir, but these were Orson Welles's techniques at the time. Uh, you see, the, the term film noir had not been invented yet. It was coined by a French film critic late in 1946 after this huge influx of American movies into Europe, and they were getting all these gritty crime dramas, so he tagged them film noir. And But... Uh, you know, Wells wasn't setting out to make a film noir. He was kind of inventing it. Uh, him and other directors like Alfred Hitchcock were just simply taking the techniques they had seen from German Impressionistic films of the 30s and infusing it into American culture. And that's how we got film noir. You know, Orson Welles was without a doubt a creative genius. It was a very important part of the American entertainment culture. I was a huge fan of him as a kid. Uh, my dad was a, was a real movie buff, and it, of course, exposed me to a lot of monster movies and film noir and things like that at a real early age. So, to me, Orson Welles was a cool dude, even at 10, you know. Uh, he had been a magician, I was interested in magic, and even at that early age I was interested in uh, movie making and being an actor, you know, and so on. So he checked a lot of boxes for me. I was really struggling with how to encapsulate the life of the original most interesting man in the world. And the answer is you don't. There is no way to give to you in this short format an inkling even of what a ripple effect he had on American culture and, and our entertainment world, filmmaking. So I'm going to urge you to take a little action. Go punch his name into whatever search engine you like. Look him up on IMDb. Find some of his movies to watch. They're all readily available, some of them even on streaming platforms or any major retailer. It's all still out there and easy to find. Um, look him up on Wikipedia. That's about nine feet of scrolling on there on him. It's a very comprehensive uh, accounting of all the things that he did in one spot. It's, it's a great read. And you know, that's my real dream for this show. I don't just want to entertain you with a cool show. I want you to come away with either some tidbits and trivia that you didn't know about the movie before, or uh, a point of view maybe you hadn't considered, or a metaphor, or something in, that was in the film that you didn't realize. And icing on that cake would be if it caused you to go out and look for more. If it caused you to go out and want to learn more about something that you had seen or heard here. So I urge you to do that. And that about wraps it up for Serbs Buried Bones. I sincerely hope that you enjoyed it. If you're watching this on a streaming, uh, on the Vortex streaming uh, at horrorhost.net, be sure to kick over to Facebook and like their page so you get all the posts and updates. 
and then skip over to YouTube and subscribe to their YouTube channel where you might find me and a whole lot of other great horror hosts and movie hosts from all over the country and also some uh, exclusive shenanigans over there that you might not otherwise see. Um, if you are watching this on a video platform where there might be down below some kind of like, uptick, um, approve of kind of button, please please click it for us to keep the, the signal boosted. And if there's a way of sharing this with your friends or on social media, please do. Comments, there are comments down below this. I welcome all kinds of feedback. So that does it for now. Thank you for watching, Serbs Buried Bones, and I'm going to go hit the archives and dig up another cinematic treat from the public domain and bring it back here for you. Getting a new hat for the luncheon, Helen? What luncheon? Why, Thelma, don't tell me you've forgotten. Forgotten? Mm -hmm. I wasn't even invited. Why, I haven't been invited anywhere for weeks. What's wrong with me, anyway? What's wrong, Helen? Maybe it's your breath. But new green mint mouthwash stops oral bad breath three ways better than antiseptics. One destroys mouth odor itself, even from onions, smoking, telltale beverages, not just germs. Because green mint contains exclusive chloroquat plus a new mouth sweetener. Two, even mixed with water, green mint has 37% more penetrating power. Three, tastes so good, leaves no antiseptic smell. Yes, with green mint, there's always a happy ending. Your mouth tastes so minty fresh, you know your breath is safe. Used professionally by over 10,000 dentists, green mint stops oral bad breath three ways better.